Turner Media. You have to listen to me first. Um, welcome. Welcome to our conference. Um, it's been since 2019 that we had a, a good group of folks together, and it just feels so overdue. Um, so, so long overdue. Um, and, and it comes, I think, at a really, really important time in our country. We have so much good attention from the administration and from funders, and there's a lot of talk about building hope and opportunity. Uh, but I think a lot of us know that we're also in the middle of a, of a, of a housing crisis and a lot of pressure on, on families, many of the families that we serve. Um, so um, to address these opportunities and to help meet the crisis at the same time, we focus this meeting called Meeting, meeting the Moment. Um, and we do that through our strength in numbers. Um, it, it matters that we work together, how we address regional challenges, uh, challenges like housing and workforce, uh, how we elevate our voice by bringing conversation to our table. Um, I think some of you heard me talk that way about like, you know, it's nice to be invited to somebody else's table to get to talk, but it, when it comes to raising our voice, it, it's good to have people come, come to where we are and to see the issues and talk about the issues as we see them um, thinking about uh, earlier today when Scott McReynolds talked about, just use the phrase about, because we're the people who get stuff done. And so it matters that they come to where we are. Uh, how we change the narrative for people in places that are affected by persistent poverty by exercising our leadership. And we're a, we're a membership that has vision and we have courage. And we have the courage to live out that vision. And I think that, that is important. Our courage doesn't come from just anywhere, it comes from our history because we've been through things before. And we know how to overcome barriers. And it also comes our courage from our relationships, right? It's always easier to find courage when we can be with, with one another. And so uh, I hope you'll find um, some time for your relationships and for building your courage while we're together over the next couple days. I hope it, it, you, know, you, you find that fulfilling. I, I've already gotten so much in such a short amount of time today. Um, so, um, really, really glad to have you here. I, it is now my, my honor to introduce uh, Bill Turner. Dr. Dr. William Turner has a career on uh, working with people of color in Appalachia. Um, he was among the very first people to combine the interests in the fields of African American and Appalachia studies. I got to know Dr. Turner, I guess, about a dozen years ago when he was at Berea College, but prior to that, I know he was at Kentucky State University and a number of other uh, another institutions. He is, in my mind, the foremost authority on what it means to be black in Appalachia. Um, and, um, and I think if you read anything about his biography in our material, I, I think you'll find that to be true. And if you didn't find it true to be there in the next couple of minutes as he speaks, it will become, I think, completely obvious um, that, that he really is a person who knows what he's talking about. Um, he is from Kentucky originally, uh, grew up in, in Lynch, Kentucky, went to the University of Kentucky uh, for his bachelor's degree. Uh, his doctorate in sociology and anthropology at Notre Dame, and it has been named as the Person of the Year by the by Christian Appalachia Project. Uh, distinguished alum from Notre Dame, introduced into the inter, inter, duck, inducted into the Civil Rights Hall of Fame in Kentucky, and recognized uh, by, <clears throat> as the Reverend uh, Martin Luther King Citizen of the Year for a lifetime of service to the Appalachian region. He's also been honored by the uh, Appalachia Studies Association, I think, just this past year. So um, uh, if you have not read, I hope you will get a copy of the Harlan Renaissance that Bill released just last year. It's been quite well acclaimed, and it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you, Dr. Turner, to the stage. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Jim. 
this, is a, this is a real distinguished guy who have a works, runs this place for you all, and uh, got a big man here. So when you know, I hear people introduce me like that, and uh, people nod, and that's impressive. It reminds me of a story from my home in Harlan County, Kentucky. Any of you ever been to Harlan County, Kentucky? So, uh, a very distinguished man in our hometown had died. And uh, the eulogist uh, presented a summary of his life, much like Jim did for me. And the eulogist talked about how this man was uh, a mason and an elk. And he was, he gave his resources to widows and orphans, and he cleaved unto his wife, and he lusted after no other woman. Amen. <laughs> uh, and so the, the widow was sitting there with her daughter while this eulogist went on and on about this man, and the, the, the mother, after hearing so much nice things said about her husband, her late husband, nudged preacher Anthony, you'll like this one, nudged her daughter and said, go up there and make sure that she have a baby in that castle. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll try. I want to thank the Fahey uh, folks. Uh, I've gotten to know them very well. Jim King's been around since 1990, y'all. I think he's going to retire here if we're not careful. Uh, I thank the board. Uh, I, I, uh, Jim knows I like spider webs. Uh, it has to do with networking. And uh, uh, I'm thinking of Fahe in terms of his Appalachian omnipresence. Is that the way you say that word? Okay. You're everywhere in Appalachia. And I thank you for what you're doing uh, in this region. I went to the Lynch Colored Public School. The Lynch Colored public school. My mother went to the Lynch Colored Public School in 1930. Uh, I left the Lynch Colored Public School in 1963. It's in Harlan County, Kentucky. And from the Lynch Colored School, I have all colored teachers. <laughs> and they taught me, Billy, when you go give a speech, you do three things, son. You tell them what you're going to tell them. You tell them what you tell them. Then you tell them what you told them. That's what I'm going to try to do. I want to dedicate this to the grandmother of Appalachian Studies. Uh, Helen taught me so much stuff. A lot of y'all know Helen. She just passed away. She was at Berea College, known for her work at the Highlander Center. And if you want to know anything about community organizing in Appalachia, read Helen Lewis's book. A wonderful lady. I met her with Rosa Parks at the Highlander Center when I was a very young man. The objectives of this presentation is those two things there. I'm gonna do a quick summary of some black history in Appalachia, try to kill a few stereotypes. There's a wonderful book you people in business should read called Successful Black Entrepreneurs. Fantastic book. Uh, I wanna do a little about the little recognized importance of the Appalachian region in terms of the history of slavery. Where do people think of the history of slavery in Appalachia? Uh, particularly uh, in this region, Abolition, the first abolitionist newspaper, was published here in Jonesboro, Tennessee, just right next door. Uh, the Civil War started in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, with John Brown and his boys. And the modern civil rights movement took its birth at the Highlander Center with Martin Luther King and Miles Tartan and other such people. You must study those. They're mentioned in a book called Blacks in Appalachia, which I helped to write in 1987, just a commercial. <laughs> the objectives of this presentation raise the profile of representation of blacks in Appalachia. Uh, uh, the next time you're looking for new hires, you have to remember some of the smartest black people ever been in the world came out of the Appalachian region. Two of them are right there. One is named Nikki Giovanni. She's a poet at Virginia Tech. Booker T. Washington, more important than Barack Obama could ever imagine himself ever having been. Booker T. Washington was the most important African American to ever live, as far as I'm concerned. Malden, West Virginia. Bill Withers, you can't sing Lean On Me unless you know something about Slab Park, West Virginia, outside of Beck. <laughs> Nina Simone is from the Appalachian portion of North Carolina. 
Oh God, I could go on and on. I'll just stop there. <laughs> Randy Moss played football. <laughs> this was West Virginia. <laughs> no hate in our hollow. That's one of the objectives I have here. I want to help define the network of executives to know that you are significant influences. And Jim had a word in the program today about you being courageous problem solvers in so far as race relations and diversity and all that's concerned. I want to have a little fun while we're doing this so that as far hate grows. For example, this coming Saturday, September 24th, if you're near Tazewell, Tennessee, just north of Knoxville, there's going to be a family-friendly clan rally. <laughs> Boy, I got so quiet, my grandma would say you could hear a nap kiss on cotton. <laughs> There's going to be a Klan rally, y'all, in Knoxville, North of Knoxville, just this coming Saturday. Oh, by the way, Appalachia. It ain't your grandmama's Appalachia no more. There are a lot of people named Jose. Hey, Jose. Lupita. Gilberto. Right? Mr. Sanchez. And people named Chiron and Patel and Sharma and Suraka. Indian population. Very professionals in the Appalachia. So you could get between cornbread and tortillas in Marstown, Tennessee, if you want to. The Hispanic, particularly the Mexican population, has replaced black populations in many parts of Appalachia, northern Alabama, Huntsville, East Tennessee, Marstown, Rogersville. The Hispanic population is three times the black population. Uh, it's a booming population in Appalachia. So let's get started and see how quickly we can do this. Uh, on the left is Rodin Stinker, so I want you to think along with me here. Jesse Owens is from Northern Alabama, that's why I have him. He was running against Adolf Hitler there in 1936 when they said, uh, so I want to start by saying I'm going to say some things that's going to hit some people in here, hopefully, like rocks on your head. And the way to remember this is, if you're growing up in the mountains of the south, you ever driven around the mountains of the south, you always see signs that say, watch for falling rocks. Right? On every highway from here to West Virginia, Route 52, watch. So there's a story behind that. Near Bryson City, North Carolina, there was a Cherokee young man lost in 1852. His name was Fallen Rocks. Fallen Rocks got lost because he had done some rabbit tobacco or something, I heard it. And ever since then, they've been looking for him. Watch for falling rocks. So I'll say some things. I'll use words sometimes like black culture and cultural war. Who am I speaking into this world? Uh, uh, progressives, conservatives, and QAnon. I'm going to say some things that might feel like falling rocks. And it ain't easy being a teacher, as I was for most of my life, or a consultant, as I try to do, when you're going to teach about or consult agencies of, on the significant events and the people and the ideas where race is concerned in America. It is very difficult to stand up in front of 75 or 100 people at 8 o'clock at night and expect to say, huh? uh, it ain't easy being green, said Kermit the Frog. And so if you agree with me to disagree with me, you're actually going to be agreeing with me. I thought you said sacrifice, not a sack of rice. I'm going to say some things I think I know I've been misunderstood before. Uh, and let me tell you that cartoon that says, oh dear, I misunderstood you. Some of you are going to misunderstand a couple things I'm going to say. So I, as a preface to what I'm trying to say is this. Imagine that man on that picture there up to the right. Uh, a young woman had walked into his studio and, uh, and she knew him because she, he had painted the portraits of her whole family and all of the people in the town. She walked in and said, Mr. Gilbert, I want you to paint me in the nude. Yes, Jim, I want you to paint me in the nude. He said, oh, no, honey, I can't do that. I, I, I painted your mama's picture. I painted your grandmama's picture. I, I, I swear I can't paint you in the nude. So she went in her purse and she pulled out five $100 bills. And she said, please paint me in the nude. He looked at all that money and said, okay, I'll paint you in the nude. But I'm going to keep my socks on <laughs> so I have something to wipe my brushes with. <laughs> so if you misunderstand me, it's your fault and not mine. I should be somewhere like I was this time a few months ago. That's a picture I took with Yo-Yo Ma. 
couple months ago on top of pleasure or something in the Smoky Mountains. Uh, uh, and I spent all my time, I, I, the, if you can see it better in the red, I, because I made these slides up myself, my son said, Dad, you need to let me start doing that. <laughs> so what if I were to say, you guys talk a good game about improving business relationships and diversity, but it's all a big charade. What if I did this blunt criticism? There's so many racial tensions in America. I could probably still be a president of this college I used to be the president was if I didn't talk straight talk about race. They got rid of me, didn't they, Jim? That's right. Shame on him. People would say to me, my daddy said to me, Bill, tone down the race talk, man. That's too controversial. This is a very tight-knit group of people. They don't like to be criticized. I'm not criticizing you. But watch the fall and rise. Raindrops keep falling from my head. See that raindrop up there? So a lot of stuff going on in this country. So that's the hard part. Anybody ever have a hard part in their hair? <laughs> that's called a hard part. See, you young people don't know nothing. That's some 1960s stuff. So let me get to the hard part. Did you know the former president is warning us that if he is indicted, there will be problems like you've never seen before in this country? He said that a week ago. Lindsey Graham said there's going to be rioting in the streets. What kind of inflection point are we at in America when it's played out like that at the national level? What does that mean to us in Appalachia? Stuart Rose, the president of the Oath Keepers. Did you know two weeks ago they did a report that showed that members of the Oath Keepers, the people who were in January the 6th, members of the military, policemen, Elected officials throughout America are Oath Keepers members, the Southern Poverty Law Center reported. And I wasn't surprised. I was like, hey, man, when I was coming along, all the sheriffs in the South were members of the Klan. <laughs> What's the big deal? What's the big deal? So are we one nation under God, individual, indivisible, or are we at an inflection point, a defining moment? Is Fahe at an inflection point? A point where a moment you come to, an existential moment where everything changes. And I think you know the answer to that. Think about it. For example, the coronavi cor coronavirus created an inflection point in America in terms of the future of work. 58% of all people don't ever want to go back to an office. I, I, I heard 50% of y'all don't want to go back to an office. <laughs> Nobody wants to go back. It's an inflection point. It changed. Uh, the climate change, the global pandemic, incoming poverty, all the inflection points. It's a good time to be alive. Is the Fahi at an inflection point, a moment of change? I think that's what you are saying. So history is a clock that people use to tell the political time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells people where they have been and what they have been, and it also tells of people where they are and what they are, and most importantly, history tells of people where they still must go and what they still must be. The lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives more sublime for in departing they leave behind them footprints in the sands of time. That's where we are, some footprints in the sands of time. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. So be careful, Fahi, what you pray for, because you might get it, <laughs> as my grandma used to say. What time is it in the footprints of Appalachia where the Fahi serves for black people in terms of quality of life issues, particularly the housing? Where are blacks on the map of human geography in the footprints of Appalachia where the Fahi serves? What have blacks in the footprints of Appalachia where the Fahi served, what have they been doing, and where have they been, and where must they still go? These are the moments we're talking about. Oh, back to the hard part. You have to think about it. Speaking of history, in 2009, I spoke in this very place. Jim, wasn't it here? In 2009, Jim King and Vice Bill Turner, oh, Jim, you did it again. <laughs> this was the opening presentation point from that PowerPoint uh, in 2009, I was the National Endowment for the Humanities Distinguished Chair of Korea uh, in 2009. We had that up there. Uh, and I asked, I said then, who am I and what do I know about black people in Appalachia? Uh, and I had that very slide. There's Harlan County in red on the map of Kentucky. That's my father. Uh, uh, the year that I was born in 1946, 76 years ago. 
And uh, my daddy brought home $40. I cry when I say that. <laughs> my daddy brought home $47.70 after two weeks in the mine. Daddy had five children. My mama had five children in seven years. That's called Step Step, where some of us come from in Alabama. I asked my dad one time, I said, Dad, five children in seven years? Dad gone, man, what's your problem? <laughs> my sister, my oldest sister, God rest her soul, Peggy, Peggy's deceased. Peggy was seven years older than I was. Mama had five children. She married dad when she was 15 in 1938. I asked father, I said, Dad, what's the deal? He said, well, buddy, let me tell you why we have so many children. You know, we lived up at the head of the hollow. When that train would come up through there every morning at 4.30, it'd wake you up. And it was too early to get up. And it was too late to go back to sleep. Uh, they did that five more times. Mama had five more children. I come, anybody from a family of 10? Yes, I'm from a family of 10. Uh, and that's what uh, I know about struggle. 2009, y'all remember that man? He was the president when I was up here in 2009. Uh, the swine flu, that <laughs> was a little bit different than the last thing. Michael Jackson died that year. Kanye West smashed Taylor Swift. Y'all remember when Kanye got up there? <laughs> some say some of y'all were 10 years old. <laughs> Pfizer, Pfizer, is that the way you say it? That's associated with the coronavirus, isn't it? In 2009, they were penalized $2.3 billion for unlawful prescription drug promotions. Tiger Woods got treated in a hospital for being drunk that night in 2009. Uh, Sullenberger flew an airplane into the Hudson River and did it safely, 2009. Speaking of inflection moments. What has happened since then? Some of the topics we covered, there were 23 million people in the 14 states of Appalachia back then. I keep talking into this thing. Uh, uh, there's about now about 3 million people of color, uh, two-thirds of the African-Americans. Uh, the Latino population has exploded since I was here 12 years ago. McDowell County, West Virginia, still has the highest percentage of black people of any county in Appalachia, but McDowell County is still the poorest county in West Virginia. Uh, most black people in Appalachia live in Alabama and Mississippi. Hold up your hands, Alabama. Alabama hit the hammer high or low. Huntsville, Birmingham, Jasper, uh, you name it. That's where the black people live in, in Appalachia, in, in Mississippi. Uh, when I was up here uh, 10 or 12 years ago, you couldn't get me to really to say it clearly how much it took to get me interested in spending my life since I went to graduate school in 1968, uh, spending my life studying about blacks in Appalachia the way I did because I had been taught that the white people in Appalachia were banjo playing, coal mining, family feuding, Scotch Irish hillbillies who toted guns, they were incestuous, they were moonshining, ornery, semi literate toothless people who were isolated out of the mainstream up there in Wise County. Uh-oh, somebody's from Wise County over here. Scott County. Yeah, that's what you, well, my grandma's from Wise County, right? So I know what you're talking about. Uh, they don't like strangers. They told some of the biggest lies about white people in the mountains of the South, and they had me believe it. And I was like, I can live here. I never saw this before. But they had it on Beverly Hill Village. They had it on Deliverance. Y'all see Deliverance? Diane Sawyer's Christmas, and now they got a guy named J.D. Vance. He's running for Senate in Ohio. See, there's fallen rocks going around here, y'all. He's going he's gonna to be the senator if, if, if the polls hold up. What will that mean for Appalachia? What did he just say three years ago? He even convinced people that it was white people in the Appalachia who elected President Trump, which was the biggest lie ever been told. He was elected by white female college graduates. In fact, speaking of inflection moments, isn't it interesting the minute Obama was elected the president, the next day the senator from Kentucky said, you might have been elected the president, but you're not going to govern. Mitch McConnell, 2009. Here we are a few years later, Mitch McConnell, 
I hope I'm not speaking out of school here, that this is nothing that far hate people want to hear. We just have a little context here. They say that the topics we discuss, these people have learned helplessness. They still are going by this culture of poverty. The, the, the people of Appalachia are the way they are because of who they are and the way they act and live and what they believe in. That's what they said about us. 12 years ago, we asked these questions. Will somebody please tell me why we've been talking about Appalachian problems ever since 1960? Will still some Will somebody please tell me why we don't stop talking, why we don't start talking more about the assets of Appalachian people rather than their problems? Nearly five billion dollars has been appropriated by the ARC, not to mention all these countless human hours that you spent trying to improve the quality of life of people in the mountains. And many people believe that some parts of Central Appalachia are no better off in 2022 than they were in 2009. That's what we're going to. Jim Branscom said the most overlooked group of people, the most underserved people in Appalachian are blacks in the region. He said that in 2009. I talked to, and Jim wrote that in 1971, by the way. Jim Branscom is a Berea College graduate, by the way. Those are some things we discussed 12 or 13 years ago. We talked about those places there because those are the places I know the best. Abington, Big Stone Gap, Marstown, Rogersville, Johnson City, Benham, Lance, blah, blah, blah. We talked about Appalachia being homogenous, one of the most homogenous regions in the nations. But that's such a joke. <laughs> Who'd have thought that Appalachia is not homogenous? In fact, Central Appalachia wasn't as homogenous as it claimed it was. And I noted back then that Fahe can transform that perception by accelerating its involvement in African American Here's some facts back then. Half of African American families in Central Appalachia lived below the poverty line. McDowell County again. The African American population in virtually every Central Appalachian County is skewed. That is to say, you have more older people than younger people, particularly in the rural areas. That's what we discussed back then. What's happened since then? Well, since then, about a month ago, I was on television, y'all. <laughs> I did the United Shades of America with W. Kamau Bell. July the 17th. In fact, you can Google it and watch it. And Gail Manchin wrote me shortly after and said, Bill, I had the opportunity today to watch the CNN focus link on blacks in Appalachia. I was blown away by how well done it was. The people they interviewed were so dynamic and expressed themselves so effectively. That's Miss, Miss Manchin right down the left. You know, her husband's name is uh, Joe Manchin. <laughs> Many times when filming in Appalachia, Gail wrote, it seems the reporters go out of their way to find people who embarrass our region instead of truly reflecting the people and where they live. I'm so very proud of this piece, and I thought you did such an outstanding job, Bill. And I'm sorry that I missed it on TV, but I felt like right here in my office, I enjoyed and appreciated it more. Gail Manchin said that. Uh, there are a lot that we've been doing. Oh, Jim, hi, I didn't show you this slide here. But Jim and I have been talking about a couple things, and we started talking about this when, when George Floyd was killed two years ago. Jim and I got on the phone and said, hey man, this is an inflection moment. And that's how I think we got in. Now we've been talking a lot. God has made it one blood all nations of the earth. Now, you people from Berea know that one, don't you? Jim and I have been talking about advancing a regional strategy to strengthen the stability and impact dearly needed nonprofits that are dedicated to serving all Appalachians. And by the way, Jim, y'all can give all of your people a copy of this slide presentation. Uh, we don't have to go back through all that. What have we been talking about? Some of these counties where the uh, population is 50% black or minority, uh, in Georgia, Alabama, all of this about Jefferson County, West Virginia, 16% of the people in Appalachian, Alabama, the population is almost 31% across 25 counties in Alabama. There's a lot of work for us to do. In places where black and brown Appalachians reside in small numbers, they may be more, even more important to support them. That's what Jim and I have been talking about. We've been talking about all those things and you can go and look at it. Uh, the overall majority and executives and staffs and boards of nonprofits throughout Appalachia are white persons. The overwhelming majority. It looks like this room. Uh, I, I'm not falling rocks, but, but it is what it is. And we have to work on this. 
because if you look at those organizations that I have there on those links, you'll see what I mean. Adam Dixon, would you stand up for a minute, please? Yeah, here's your new board member, Mr. Adam Dixon. Adam is an alderman here in Jonesboro, Tennessee. He has a wonderful film coming out called Appalachian Soul uh, that I hope you will Google and check it out. Uh, but Adam will be around. And Adam, anybody know Alex Gibson? Wonderful Berea College graduate. Alex may be the only African American CEO of a major nonprofit in Appalachia, and rightly so, it's Apple Shop. If you don't know nothing about Apple Shop, you work for the wrong firm. Uh, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Alliance of Northeastern Tennessee. Does anybody here remember that organization? There's a Diversity Alliance, Equity, and Inclusion Alliance of Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia, the purple area in the maps there. Uh, and they are doing active work to support businesses to adopt practices that help people. What have Jim and I been talking about? The, that web there, uh, it has Fahe in the middle of it, but when we put that together and said to Jim, he said, take Fahe out of the middle of that. This must be run by black people and not by Fahe. So you reverse that bill, you've lost your mind. I said, oh, I'm sorry, Jim. So we got that straight. But we've been trying to bring some organizations together. And I challenge you, as you go back to your places, try to identify black organizations. Heck, I could go home with some of you, and I know every black organization in town in two days. It's not that hard to do. All you got to do is go find Reverend Anthony Brown or Miss Willie May. <laughs> They'll tell you where all the black organizations are. They'll tell you the Omega Psi Phi and the Alpha Kappa Alphas and the Phi Beta Sigmas and the NAACP and the Urban League and the little organization. Just got to find them and pull them and help them. Black organizations are throughout Central and Southern Appalachia. What does your office look like? Stop calling it diversity and call it equal opportunity. I challenge people wherever I go to say, name two black people you know that are entrepreneurs or business women and men, and they have no connection to entertainment or sports. And 99% of the people I ask that cannot do that. So how would we ever expect a black kid trapped in poverty in Appalachia if they can't say, oh, I know a mortgage banker that's so-and-so that does housing in Appalachia, he's black. She's black. That's what we have to work on. Anything that benefits and impacts black people benefits and impacts positively everybody. This is not a zero-sum game. You don't win anything when other people win, and you don't lose anything when other people win, and you don't lose anything when other people win. Do FIA partners hire black-owned professional service firms? Do FIA partners hire black consultants to help them map these communities and figure out what they're trying to do. How many of us know mortgage loan officers, mortgage loan originators, mortgage underwriters? Man, I didn't know so many words had mortgage in it until I started doing this person. Dang, go, oh, man, there's a lot of good jobs out there. And how many people in those professions, how diverse are those professions? Y'all know them better than I do. Finally, I would like to say, never waste a good crisis. This is said by my friend Shauna Scott, Professor of Sociology at University of Kentucky. That's a picture of Hazard, Kentucky right there. So when you go back to your offices and start working on all of what we must do to rebuild after the disaster in eastern Kentucky, build energy efficient housing, use renewable technology, reclaim common spaces, gain community access to lands that have been controlled by hedge funds and corporations, particularly coal companies, reforestation, and most in the red, pursue social and environmental and participatory justice. That's what I would like to see come back out of the great flood of 22 in my home state. Well, y'all, I'm about done playing my tune. I should have bought my banjo with me. But before I finish, I want to say, uh, introduce you all to my next book. That's my hand right there. I'm working on it. My book is going to be called An Open Letter to My White Appalachian Friends and Colleagues Who Are Serious About Making of Old Appalachia a New Appalachia. Thank you very much. I hope that some of what I've said has made you think differently about what we must do if we are to meet the moment. Uh, thank you, God bless you, God bless each of one, and let us work together to make up this old world a new one. Thank you very much.